Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, part three of our International Tax Reform webinar series. Um, in today's presentation, we will be discussing miscellaneous um, international tax type changes, and then also some state and local tax issues and implications associated with the international tax reform. Um, my name is uh, Ron Scharmberg. I'm joined here by Matt Hunsaker, John Lobb, and Don Lonzak. And we will now begin the presentation. So uh, before we begin, um, if you do have any questions about anything that's discussed during the presentation, uh, please email them to Megan Green, and we will answer them following the presentation. Um, her email is megan.green at bakerbots.com. Um, also, and probably the most important thing, uh, with respect to the CLE credit, this will be in, the code for the credit will be announced at the end of the presentation. Please include this code on the affirmation form, which you can download in the reminder email, which was sent to you yesterday. And if you do not have this form, uh, please email Megan Green at megan.green at bakerbot.com. So now as we uh, move on to the actual presentation itself, um, as with the, uh, the, the prior uh, parts of this webinar, uh, we will have some graphs and illustrations um, showing some different uh, charts. And in those uh, charts, as with respect to the U.S. tax legend, if you have a rectangle, it will be a corporation, a triangle will be a partnership, a circle oval will be a disregarded entity, and then if we're discussing a U.S. entity, it will be a gray-colored shape, and if it's a foreign entity, it will be a red-colored shape. So um, with that said, uh, as far as the order of the presentation, we'll first uh, discuss miscellaneous uh, tax changes. Then we'll address the state and local tax implications, and then finally we'll conclude with a, a couple master charts that kind of put everything together that we discussed throughout this three-part webinar series. So with that said, I'll turn it over to uh, John Lobb to uh, move on with uh, section one of the presentation. Thanks, Ron. So in the, uh, the prior two webinars that we did, we talked about kind of different changes to the international tax rules that were really kind of fundamentally adding new concepts or adding concepts in a different way. So we talked about the transition tax and the quasi-territorial system, and we talked about guilty and beat and FDII. And the uh, Tax Reform Act did make other changes to the international tax rules that were already in the code, and so that's kind of what we're calling the miscellaneous changes. So we're going to just kind of go through, um, go through those. So the first couple of rule changes we'll talk about relate to Section 367. And just by way of background, Section 367 is really a, a rule that's overlaid on the subchapter C rules that involve uh, transfers relating to corporations. And so at a high level, Section 367 applies when the transfer involves a foreign corporation. Section 367A generally requires a U.S. person to recognize gain but not loss on the transfer of property other than intangible property, which we'll cover here in a minute. Uh, to a foreign corporation in a transaction that would otherwise be tax-free under Section 332, 351, 354, 356, or 361. Prior to 2018, 367A included an exception that allowed the U.S. transferor in one of those transactions to avoid gain recognition on transfers of certain types of property if the foreign corporation would then use the property in the active conduct of a foreign business. So that exception was repealed under the Tax Reform Act for post-2017 transfers. So now a U.S. person generally can't avoid gain recognition on uh, transferring tangible property to a foreign corporation. Tax Reform Act also made some changes that affect Section 367D. Section 367D applies to transfers of intangible property by a U.S. person to a foreign person in a Section 351 or 361 exchange. If Section 367D applies, then the transfer is treated as if it's a sale of the intangible property in exchange for payments that are contingent on the future uh, use or productivity of the intangible, and the U.S. person has to recognize or has to include an income over the useful life of the intangible super royalty payments that are really payments commensurate with the income that's produced by the, t the intangible property. So really what that means is that the IRS has a leeway to take this hindsight type approach that requires income inclusions based on the actual productivity of the intangible, regardless of what the fair market value was at the time of the transfer. 
for this purpose, intangible property is defined under Section 936. And uh, prior to tax reform, there had been a question about whether that included items like foreign goodwill and going concern value. The IRS thought that those items were included, but taxpayers, based on some favorable legislative history and other authorities, thought they, they were not. So as noted here, the Tax Reform Act resolved that issue by uh, making clear in the code that intangible property is expanded and does include workforce in place, goodwill, going concern value, and any other item, the value or potential value of which is not attributable to tangible property or services of an individual. And so with this rule kind of coupled with the prior rule, the repeal of the active business exception, um, just again, making it much more difficult for U.S. people to, to make outbound transfers of property. So so I guess on, on this, with respect to this point, this is kind of what we addressed, I guess, I think in part one of the, of the webinar where, you know, these rules, if, you, if you're operating through a branch or you have a disregarded entity, you know, in a foreign jurisdiction and you want to take advantage of the, uh, the new participation exemption, um, you know, simply checking the box of that entity and or transferring those assets to an actual foreign corporation, you know, may not be tax effective. Right, yeah, this will effectively be a uh, toll charge on, on getting out of the U.S. and into the, the territorial system. So the next few changes uh, relate to the subpart F rules. And the, the first change we'll talk about is an expansion of the uh, constructive ownership rules under Section 958, which apply for purposes of determining whether a foreign corporation is a CFC and whether a U.S. person is a U.S. shareholder. So under prior law, uh, prior to tax reform, 958b4 precluded downward attribution of foreign corporation stock from a foreign parent to a U.S. subsidiary. And the Tax Reform Act repealed that rule for uh, starting with the last tax year of a foreign corporation beginning before January 1, 2018. And so now uh, this expands the universe of potential CFCs and potential U.S. shareholders. And we had talked about this change a little bit in the first webinar in connection with the transition tax under 965 and uh, showed how this change to the attribution rules could cause more foreign corporations to be viewed as uh, specified foreign corporations whose uh, earnings are subject to, to repatriation under the 965 tax. Another expansion in the, the subpart F area is in the definition of a U.S. shareholder. So under Section 951, only a U.S. shareholder of a CFC is required to pick up subpart F and guilty inclusions. For pre-2018 years, 951B <clears throat> defined U.S. shareholder as any person that owned at least 10% by vote <clears throat> of the stock of a foreign corporation. The Tax Reform Act expanded that definition for post-2017 years <clears throat> and now defines a U.S. shareholder as any person that owns 10% by vote or value of the stock of a foreign corporation. So that, uh, again, like the attribution rule change, this expands the universe of people who may be required to pick up subpart F inclusions. Yeah, and I guess this one significantly hinders a, a common kind of planning approach, you know, pre-act, right? I think one of the common approaches that uh, people would take to try to avoid kind of a CFC type status was to use a, um, a low vote kind of high value stock arrangement. Right. I think, you know, these significantly kind of curtail, cur curtail that planning opportunity. Right. Yeah. I think the strategy you're talking about is that you would have a, a U.S. shareholder that maybe owns a significant portion of the value of a company, but it would only own 9% of the vote to avoid U.S. shareholder status. So that, that's effectively uh, not, not effective anymore. So just an example to illustrate how these rules affect, um, you know, some common structures. So simple structure here, you have foreign parent owns 100% of the stock of U.S. sub, and foreign parent owns 91%, and U.S. sub owns 9% of the stock of foreign sub. And you might end up in this situation if, for example, foreign parent acquired the stock of U.S. sub, and U.S. sub at the time owned foreign sub, and then after the acquisition, did a decontrol transaction where foreign parent contributes assets to foreign sub and effectively removed under the prior rules foreign sub from uh, CFC status and income or by foreign sub would not have been subpart F income. But now with the uh, changes to attribution, you have the foreign parent's 91% ownership of foreign sub is attributed downward to US sub 
the U.S. sub is now the constructive owner of 100% of the stock of foreign sub, meaning that foreign sub is a CFC. And also, U.S. sub, now it's the 100% owner constructively of foreign sub, so it is a U.S. shareholder of foreign sub. <clears throat> um, one point that's important to note is that although U.S. sub is the constructive owner of all the stock of foreign sub, its uh, subpart F inclusion is only based on its direct and indirect ownership of foreign sub. It's not, it doesn't include its constructively owned stock. So if foreign sub has subpart F or guilty for a year, um, U.S. sub would only pick up its 9% share based on direct ownership. A couple of other subpart F changes to note. One involves the 30-day uh, requirement. So for pre-2018 years, a U.S. shareholder is required to pick up subpart F income with respect to a foreign corp only if the corporation was a CFC for an uninterrupted 30, period of 30 days during the year. That, that's now been repealed so that if the foreign corporation is a CFC at any time, there's a, a subpart F inclusion. And I think it's important to note on that one, again, a common technique that was utilized pre-Act is if you acquired a, a foreign corporation and you wanted to do some restructuring. So in the in the event, let's just say you're a, a flow-through entity in the, on the U.S. and you wanted all your, your foreign entities to also be kind of passed through or flow-through vehicles. And so I know a common technique that was utilized was you would go acquire, say, a, a foreign target from a, you know, a foreign seller. So it was not a CFC at any point at that point in time. But then when you acquired it, you basically had a 30-day window to effectively convert it or get it into a flow-through form without right. having to worry about subpart F issues. Right. But now with this change, you know, that's no longer going to be the case. You're going to have to be concerned about those subpart F issues anytime you're trying to do those type of conversions. Right. Yeah, so now if you acquire foreign corp in your example and you do, say, a liquidation, it's a taxable liquidation, you'd have to worry about, well, if there's subpart F income generated on the theme sale of the assets, uh, that's going to result in some inclusion now to the, the U.S. shareholder. And I guess also, I guess it would equally apply to guilty income too, potentially, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so another change involves foreign base company oil-related income. So pre-2018, subpart F income included foreign oil-related income uh, earned by certain CFCs. And so now that, that rule has been repealed, although it's worth noting that uh, income that would have been subpart F income under the foreign based company oil related income rule may still be subject to tax under the guilty rules since guilty uh, can include uh, FORI. The, the next change is a kind of a new rule involving uh, denial of deductions for payments that are made in connection with hybrid situations involving transactions or entities that are treated differently for U.S. and foreign tax purposes. and. We'll get into the specific of the rule, but the basic idea is really denying taxpayers the ability to plan uh, internal hybrid transactions that result in double deductions in the U.S. in a foreign country or deductions in the U.S. and no income inclusion in a foreign country. It's similar to one of the uh, BEPS action items that the OECD released a couple of years ago. So the specific rule is Section 267, Cap A. Under this rule, there's no deduction allowed for disqualified related party amounts that are paid or accrued pursuant to a hybrid transaction or buyer to a hybrid entity. And for that purpose, disqualified related party amount is interest or royalty payments by a U.S. person to a related party. The extent that amounts results in either no income inclusion or a deduction in the related party's home country. Hybrid transaction is any transaction, series of transactions, agreement, or instrument uh, one, of the, one or more payments under which are treated as interest or royalties in the U.S., but not in the recipient's home country. And then a hybrid entity is an entity that's a pass-through for U.S. tax purposes, but a corporation in its home country or vice versa. The, the next rule we'll talk about um, involves tax treatment of a foreign person sale of a partnership interest. And so this is a change that was made effective for uh, transfers occurring after November 27th of last year. Under this rule, gain or loss recognized by a foreign person from the sale of an interest in a partnership that's engaged in the U.S. trader business is effectively connected income to the extent that sale of the partnership's assets would have produced effectively connected income, so kind of a look-through approach. And this rule has actually uh, got a lot of attention over the past year. Uh, the background is the IRS 
in uh, Revenue Ruling 91-32 had taken the position that this was how uh, the sale of a partnership interest by a foreign person was taxed under law that was then in effect. The ruling had a number of technical flaws and holes and practitioners really viewed it as being poorly reasoned and a lot of taxpayers took positions contrary to the ruling. And the IRS had challenged at least one of those taxpayers and the taxpayer ultimately went to court. And last year, the tax court in this case, uh, Grecian Magnesite, uh, found in favor of the taxpayer and essentially said the ruling wasn't really supported by the law. So this uh, change to the code is really a way to legislate the IRS's position, so now it is the law. Uh, tax Reform Act also amended Section 1446, uh, the rule on withholding for ECI earned by a foreign person, and so that requires transfer of a partnership interest to withhold 10% uh, on the amount realized on a sale of a partnership interest unless the transferor can demonstrate it's not a foreign person. Uh, this rule kind of immediately caused uproar from the MLP community, which you know, publicly traded stock is, uh, or publicly traded partnership interests, may be very difficult to get forms and kind of administer the withholding. So the IRS pretty quickly put out a notice saying it would suspend for now the withholding requirement for uh, sales of publicly traded partnership interests. And the IRS also earlier this week issued some interim guidance on how to apply the withholding rules on, you know, different forms that need to be provided uh, on sales of non-publicly traded partnership interests. Uh, one of the last changes we'll talk about, uh, a change to the sourcing rules under Section 863. So for pre-2018 years, income from sales of inventory that the taxpayer produced in the U.S. and sold outside the U.S. or vice versa was a portion between U.S. and foreign sources. Um, generally, the portion was 50-50, although there were some special rules on natural resource income and some other types of income. Uh, the Tax Reform Act changed this rule for post-2017 years, and now income from sales of uh, taxpayer-produced inventory is sourced entirely based on the place of production. So that means that income uh, from sale of inventory produced in the U.S. and sold outside the U.S. is 100% uh, U.S. source, not foreign source, as the slide says, 100% U.S. source based on the place of production. I mean, a question there is, well, is this going to encourage people to, you know, locate production operations outside the U.S.? I mean, to the extent people want to earn foreign source income, presumably that would have that kind of an incentive. Yeah, so that seems to be contradict most of the other changes that were made to the code to try to encourage domestic type activities in production. Yeah. So then uh, the last miscellaneous international rule to talk about is some changes to the interest expense allocation rules. Um, Pre-2018, taxpayers could allocate interest expense among members of their affiliated group based on tax basis or fair market value of assets. And the Tax Reform Act changed that rule for post-2017 years, and so now taxpayers are required to allocate interest expense using the adjusted basis of assets. And so that, uh, that type of change could have adverse effects on foreign source income calculation for taxpayers that have uh, high value but low basis tax assets located outside the U.S. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Hunsaker, who's going to talk about the state and local issues. All right. Um, I'm appreciative of all the all those of you who have stuck through all of this waiting for the grand finale on state and local tax issues. Um, I, I suppose either I was put at the end of this series uh, just so we wouldn't uh, scare anyone away or else I'd like to think it was so that we would uh, keep people on the edge of their seats and interested in the series. I recognize that many folks are probably uh, federal practitioners and may have limited uh, exposure to state taxes. Uh, for those of you who uh, have state taxes as a big part of your responsibilities and would like to take a deeper dive into this, feel free to send me an email and uh, if we get enough interest we can 
put together a more robust state tax presentation. Uh, that would probably have to come uh, many months from now, given that we know so little at this point about how states are going to respond to international tax reform. But please do send me an email if that's of interest to you. Okay, this slide is going to sum up everything we really know about how uh, states are going to respond to international tax reform. We really don't know at, at this point. Uh, states are still studying this. And you know, it was interesting, I was, I was having lunch with one of my partners and he, we were talking to a client and he was lamenting how some IRS guidance that he was interested in was going to take six months to come out. And I thought that that was like a world record for getting guidance out. I, I wouldn't expect to see much guidance come out of the states except perhaps the, the bigger, more sophisticated states uh, for some time. All right, today we're gonna cover a few topics. The first one we're gonna talk about is federal conformity. And that will be just a high level background uh, information that we'll need for the rest of the presentation. Then we'll talk a little bit about the transition tax, uh, guilty and FDII, and then we'll close up with just a few miscellaneous issues. Okay, so the reason why we are starting off talking about federal conformity is this is really what causes most of the state and local tax issues uh, from, from international tax reform. Now the states typically uh, piggyback off the Internal Revenue Code to determine state taxable income, um, but they do that in a number of different ways, and they really fall into three different camps. The first one is states that we refer to as rolling conformity states, these are states that adopt the Internal Revenue Code as currently in effect. So as legislation comes out, it's automatically incorporated into the state tax system. Then there's other states that we refer to as static conformity states. And what these states do is they select a version of the Internal Revenue Code that suits their policies, but they do not like the idea of uh, of uh, the federal Congress making changes that they automatically adopt. And so they pick a version of the Internal Revenue Code that they like, and then as needed, they will uh, specifically update that incorporation. The third group is what we call selective conformity states. So these are the states that don't just adopt the Internal Revenue Code, but they actually go and pick and choose specific provisions in the Internal Revenue Code to make up their own tax code. Now the states, even though they may adopt a version of the Internal Revenue Code, like the black sheep here, they uh, generally don't fully conform. And so what the states will typically do is if they see items in the Internal Revenue Code that don't fit with the state's policies, then they will uh, decouple and what that means is that they may modify federal law, so they may incorporate the Internal Revenue Code, but then tweak provisions within the code to suit their needs. Or they may uh, wholesale replace uh, provisions of the Internal Revenue Code. Where you see this most often is uh, with net operating losses where the states will just uh, require you to add back your federal NOL and then compute a separate state NOL. And then sometimes states will just completely eliminate federal law. This happens a lot with changes to cost recovery provisions. Uh, states will often, uh, particularly the rolling conformity states, will often go in and specifically decouple from changes to cost recovery. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about how states adopt the Internal Revenue Code. We need to kind of see how the rubber meets the road. So the states will typically select an, a line item on the corporate income tax return as the starting point for computing state taxable income. So they'll take the federal taxable income amount and then they will make adjustments to it to arrive at state taxable income. 
And there's really two ways of doing this. And this is really going to be kind of, the difference between these two ways is gonna kind of be key to a lot of our discussion today. So we have line 28 states. And these are states that use as their starting point federal, federal taxable income before NOLs and special deductions. And then the other camp is line 30 states. And these states will use as their starting point line 30, which is taxable income after NOLs and special deductions. So keep that in the back of your mind. That is going to be uh, really important as we get into this. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dig too deep into some of the, the core provisions of international tax reform. If you have questions about that, I'd refer you back to part one or part two of this series. What we want to talk about first, though, is what states are doing with the transition tax. The first question is whether the transition tax income will be included in state taxable income. And this is where the conformity issues are important. So if you have a static conformity state, a state that selects the Internal Revenue Code on a specific date, well, because they've picked a date in the past, any changes as a result of uh, tax reform are not going to be picked up and incorporated into the, the, into the state tax system. The rolling conformity states, on the other hand, will automatically pick up the changes due to tax reform, but that doesn't necessarily mean the transition tax income is going to be uh, included in state taxable income. Uh, many states have provisions that either exclude or modify subpart F income. So even if you have a rolling conformity state that would pick up uh, the transition tax provisions, uh, that income still may be excluded from state taxable income. And then there are a few states that will treat subpart F income as dividend income and will apply the state dividends received deduction. And the, the state dividend received deductions are usually pretty robust. So those are a couple of ways in which a, role, in which a taxpayer in a rolling conformity state may not pick up transition tax income. The other way that this could happen is a rolling conformity state could, uh, their legislature could actually meet and elect to decouple from the transition tax provisions. The next question is whether states will allow the transition tax deduction. Recall this is the deduction that uh, brings the transition tax uh, down to the specified effective tax rate. Uh, this deduction appears to be included on line 28 of the corporate income tax return. My colleagues here will correct me if I misspeak on that. So uh, rolling conformity states then that our line 28 states and even line 30 states are going to automatically pick up that transition tax deduction. The risk there though is that the states could go in and decouple from the deduction. That would be kind of a jerk move, but um, you know a lot of states are hurting right now and uh, it's a uh, quite possible that they could do that as a way to grab additional revenue. Okay, so there's a way that this could result in a taxpayer windfall. And the way this would work is if you're in a state that excludes transition, uh, transition tax income from state tax, either because they have a provision that excludes or reduces subpart F income, or the state treats it as a dividend and applies the dividend received deduction. So in that case, you would exclude the income, but the states may not have a, an existing mechanism to also exclude the deduction. So best case scenario there is you are able to exclude all the transition tax income, but take the deduction, which would be a, a big windfall to taxpayers. Um, it's somewhat of a dream because I, I don't think that any states that are in this position are going to allow that to happen, and there'll uh, most certainly be legislation to uh, decouple from the deduction in those cases. 
Now, on the other hand, there's also a potential state windfall, and that's if you're in a rolling conformity state that includes the transition income and state income, but then the state chooses to decouple from the deduction. And, you know, the states may argue that the deduction is really just an effective tax rate issue and is not really required. Um, and so those states that are hurting for revenue very well could uh, decouple from the deduction. Now, we should also talk about some constitutional issues. For those of you who aren't real familiar with the state tax world, everything that happens in state tax is based on uh, constitutional authority for the states to tax commerce. And if we have a situation where a state uh, requires you to uh, include the transition tax income, because you're not also required to include uh, income from domestic subsidiaries. Uh, there's a, a case called Kraft v. Iowa that would suggest that treating the foreign entities and the domestic entities differently would run afoul of the Foreign Commerce Clause exemption. Interesting, it would be the Foreign Commerce Clause, uh, it, it doesn't allow you to discriminate against foreign commerce, but it also doesn't allow a state to take a position that would prevent the, the federal government from speaking when, with one voice. So this is kind of a tricky situation where the government has really spoken to this issue because this is all based on federal legislation. But you could still uh, make the argument under Kraft that uh, by, adopting these, by adopting the inclusion of transition income, the states are somehow preventing the federal government from speaking with one voice and therefore causing a problem with the Foreign Commerce Clause. Another issue is that state income taxes need to be fairly apportioned. And in this situation, if you're bringing in income from subsidiaries, but you are not uh, also bringing in the apportionment factors of those subsidiaries, then you would have arguments that the tax is uh, is no longer being fairly apportioned because you're apportioning income uh, without actually looking at the apportionment factors that generated that income. Some other things to be aware of, the, state, or the, the federal government has allowed taxpayers to elect to include this income or to pay the tax on the income uh, over eight years and it, states may not allow that same election. So you could have a situation where all of the state tax attributable to transition tax becomes due immediately. Another issue is if you do have all that income coming in at once and it's being apportioned by reference to that year's apportionment factors, you could really have a situation, it could be good or bad either way, but you could have a situation where you kind of have an unusual apportionment profile that year. Uh, which could uh, cause uh, a lot of additional income to be uh, attributed to the state, or uh, you know, if you're able to plan carefully, you might be able to reduce your apportionment factor and push some of that repatriation income out of the state. I think that this is probably going to be a situation that's ripe for arguments about using alternative apportionment. The states typically have, they, they have, uh, formulary apportionment where you, you basically follow a formula to apportion your income. But there, in almost all states, there's a safety valve where if the formula produces a result that doesn't fairly reflect income in the state that you can petition or the state on its own can require you to use alternative apportionment. Uh, alternative apportionment just on its own is really a hot button issue right now, but it could become really important if we have uh, repatriation tax that's uh, maybe being included uh, in a year where the apportionment factor is a little askew. All right, let's talk about guilty. Again, uh, look to part two of this uh, series if you want more information on the ins and outs of guilty. Uh, guilty, the is going to be included on line 28 of 
Form 1120. Just kind of store this in your memory for a bit. We'll, we'll come back to why this is important in a little bit. Uh, the deduction that's used to bring the effective rate down is reported on line 29 uh, as a special deduction. That deduction is under uh, Section 250, which falls within Part 8, which is special deductions for corporations. So remember that for a moment. We'll come back to that being important, why that's important. Okay, so the first threshold question is whether guilty income is going to be included in state taxable income. Uh, just as we discussed previously, the answer is probably no for static conformity states, unless they uh, selectively adopt uh, Section 951A, and states may very well do that as an opportunity to gain additional income. The rolling conformity states will automatically adopt 951A, uh, but states could then elect to decouple. But the question you have to ask yourself is why a state would want to decouple from a provision that increases income. Uh, I will give one reason why they may want to or why they may be forced to uh, later on in this uh, discussion. Now, as I mentioned before, some states will exclude subpart F income from state income. Guilty, though it, it uh, has uh, flavors of subpart F income, is not necessarily subpart F income. And so in those states that have exclusions for subpart F income, it's likely that it, that exclusion will not be helpful in excluding guilty. Uh, similarly, some states will recharacterize subpart F income as dividend income yeah, so that taxpayers can claim the state dividends received deduction. Uh, of course, that is not going to work, though, unless states uh, either, uh, you know, through administrative guidance or legislation, recast uh, guilty income as uh, dividends. All right, so with guilty, we have some of the same constitutional problems that we talked about with the transition tax. So in this case, you're, you're by requiring it, you to include income from foreign subsidiaries without a corollary requirement to include income from domestic subsidiaries, that could cause uh, foreign commerce clause problems. Uh, and under the Kraft case, that might not be allowed. And similarly, if you are bringing in guilty income that is subject to apportionment, but you're not flowing through the factors from those uh, foreign entities, then uh, there'd be a strong argument that the tax is no longer fairly apportioned. So if you recall back a slide or two ago, I said that why would a state decouple from guilty? Well, it may be that they take the same view that it, it causes constitutional problems and as a result may, uh, uh, may decouple from it. More likely, though, is that if a taxpayer uh, prevails in one of these constitutional arguments, that the state would then be forced to decouple. Uh, this will be really interesting. I think that this is essentially guaranteed litigation. Um, so uh, this is something to to keep focused on in the, in the coming months and years. Next question is whether states will allow the Section 250 guilty deduction. Uh, if you recall back a few slides ago, we said that it appears that the deduction is going to show up on line 29 as a special deduction. And what this means is that those states that are line 28 states that use line 28 uh, taxable income as the starting point for calculating state taxable income, well, they're not going to pick up the Section 250 deduction. On the other hand, uh, the line 30 states, those states that pick, pick up uh, taxable income after special deductions, well, they could very well uh, include uh, Section 250 uh, deduction in the calculation of taxable income. What I think you'll probably see here is a handful of states that are hurting for revenue uh, decoupling. Th this would be the line 30 states 
decoupling from uh, Section 250 as a way to uh, bolster revenue. All right, let's uh, take a look at the best case scenario. This is really similar to the transition tax and the, the best case scenario is that a state would exclude guilty income but allow the deduction. And just as with the transition tax analysis that we talked about a while ago, uh, legislature is unlikely to allow this result. But you never know, you know, the states, some states lack some degree of sophistication and it's not, it's not uh, beyond the realm of possibility that a state or two may not pick up on this, but I, I think it's probably unlikely. And then the worst case scenario is that the state includes guilty, but then decouples from, either decouples if they're a rolling conformity state from 250 or else if they're a line 28 state, uh, don't specifically uh, adopt section 250 in that case you pick up the, the guilty income, but you don't pick up the deduction uh, associated with it. Okay, let's talk a little, for a second about FDII deduction. You're gonna see a lot of similarities in the analysis here. Uh, section 250 allows a deduction for certain, certain income earned by U.S. taxpayer from foreign sources, and if you, would like to get more information on that deduction, go back to part two of this series. And so uh, this is essentially the same analysis that we just went went through. The static conformity states aren't going to adopt the, won't automatically adopt the FDII deduction unless the legislature acts. And the rolling conformity states, uh, uh, the FDII deduction should be a, a special deduction, so line 28 states won't automatically pick it up. Uh, line states, line 30 states will pick it up unless they affirmatively uh, decouple from the federal deduction. All right, there's a few other issues that are important, uh, but we don't have time to discuss today, and that is the treatment of the participation exemption under state law. Uh, it remains to be seen what states will, will do there. It may be a moot question in many states that have a very robust dividends received deduction. And then the base erosion anti-abuse tax, uh, that is a separate tax and so uh, the states won't automatically pick that up even if they're a rolling conformity state. And so the question is will states do things on their own? And this is really a hot issue right now among the states. Uh, the states are, are, are trying all sorts of things to, uh, uh, you know, to address the base erosion and profit shifting. Um, one of those is that they, ha they have tax haven legislation which expands water's edge reporting to worldwide reporting if uh, you have uh, if you have subsidiaries operating in what the states refer to as tax havens. Um, that's kind of an interesting issue right now. I think that, I'm surprised I haven't seen much litigation on this because I think it's pretty clearly unconstitutional for the states uh, to adopt tax haven legislation. But I would not expect the states to mimic the beat tax, but to continue to pursue their own agenda and their own mechanisms for combating abuses, which don't always, uh, you know, the abuses at the, in the state tax world are not always the same as in the federal world, so the solutions are most likely to be different. All right, so what does the future hold? I'll pull out my crystal ball for you. Uh, I think that this picture of this iceberg kind of sums up where we're at in the state tax world right now. We've identified some, some issues uh, that we've talked about today. It's unclear how those are going to be resolved, but what I would expect is for even more issues to start to creep up as we start to see returns being filed and as we start to see guidance coming out of the state. So when will that guidance come? I, I, 
I would not hold your breath. The states are continuing to study it. Some of the bigger states have released studies already. Uh, New York and California have released fairly robust studies of the implications of uh, tax reform on their tax system. Uh, but the smaller states that don't have as many resources are probably likely, unlikely to uh, give guidance any time in the near future. So with that, that's the conclusion of the state tax piece. Again, just reiterate that uh, if you'd like to have a more fulsome discussion of the state tax issues and really dig into it, please send me an email. Uh, my email address is on the, the second slide. And if we have uh, enough inches, we'll put together a, a, uh, another uh, presentation. Well, thanks, Matt, for the uh, riveting discussion on the state and local tax issues. Uh, that was definitely very informative. Um, as a federal practitioner, I did not realize the complexity or all of the, the various issues that really come up on the state side as a result of all these, uh, the international tax reform changes. So with that said, now we're going to move on into the final part of our presentation today. And, and, and what the intent here is, is we are going to present two different uh, structure chart summaries uh, that highlight you know, a, what we would say a, a typical kind of structure chart that where all the different entities and activities uh, may operate. And then we'll show different payment streams and basically highlight the different issues now that tax, re tax reform presents to the various kind of payment, uh, payment streams and mechanics and structures. And so it's really a way to kind of tie everything together and, and remind everyone what, what, need, what everybody needs to be thinking about when they examine, you know, structure charts and or payment flows as a result of the, uh, the tax reform. So with that said, uh, the first chart here is a uh, U.S. parent multinational group uh, summary example. And so as you can see in, in this chart, what we have is we have a, a U.S. parent ultimately at the top of the chain. Um, in this chart, it has a, a U.S. OPCO, that's a corporation that conducts various activities. There's also a, a foreign branch that is effectively held through a disregarded entity. Uh, the, the U.S. parent that also owns, you know, a CFC type chain where it has CFC subs, the CFC hold co. It also has a, a foreign OPCO that is basically through a disregarded entity. And then there are some unrelated parties that are relevant to the structure slides. Um, there's a bank that's provided a loan, another foreign unrelated party that are, or several foreign unrelated parties that are responsible for providing some income revenue to some of the foreign activities or even the U.S. entity. And then also there's potentially some acquirers that may be interested in, in purchasing um, one of the CFCs. So as we walk through this, this structure chart, just the, the things to keep in mind that we've discussed now throughout this, this webinar series. Is, is we can see at, at the U.S. parent level, you know, the first kind of payment flow that we have is a dividend that would come up from the CFC for and hold co. So, you know, the, the thing that's the important to keep in mind there and what we've discussed, right, is, is how does that dividend qualify now under this participation exemption, the new participation exemption? You know, is it, is it exempt from, from U.S. tax as a result of qualifying? You know, the second thing would be if, if U.S. parent is potentially exploring contributing assets down to the, the CFC, the, the, the CFC entities, you know, as, as discussed in this webinar today, you know, you no longer can qualify for the active trader business exception in 367A. And then also, you know, there's an expanded intangible uh, definition under 367D, which picks up goodwill and going concern value. So, you know, that's something that needs to be analyzed that is different uh, potentially different from, from pre-tax reform. The third uh, payment flow or, or mechanics under this under structure slide involves a loan that comes from the bank to the U.S. parent. And in this situation, if the CFC foreign hold code guarantees that loan, you know, we still have to be mindful of Section 956 issues. So even though, as we discussed, a dividend of the earnings and profits up from the CFC foreign hold code to U.S. parent you know, may or should qualify for the participation exemption, you're still not allowed to use those earnings and profits, basically, you know, pre-distributed earnings and profits to effectively guarantee or as credit support on a, on a U.S. loan, 956 is still an issue. The fourth thing from the U.S. parent's perspective is this foreign branch that operates through a disregarded entity. You know, as, as we kind of emphasize throughout the, uh, the presentation, 
um, one of the one of the issues is the participation exemption does not apply to those to those activities uh, because it's operated through a branch and not a CFC. Uh, you know, FDII potentially would not apply also because it's operated you know through a foreign branch. And then another important aspect is there's actually a separate foreign tax credit basket now applicable to that income. Um, so you'd have to be mindful of that as well. And before I uh, move on with, with any more of this uh, summary chart, um, let me now read, it's 50 minutes into the presentation, so I'll read the, uh, the all important CLE code. So all lawyers participating via webinar or phone must note the following code on their affirmation form to earn the appropriate number of CLE credits. And that code for today's presentation is 19275. That's 19275. So now back to the uh, to the chart. If we now move over to the look at the U.S. Opco, you know what is tax reform, or what are the things to keep in mind here? Well, the first thing, if you look at income stream five, right, the income revenue that U.S. Opco is earning from a foreign unrelated party, well, you know that might qualify under this the new FDII provisions. So that would be something to, to track. And then as far as its related party payment now being made to say CFC sub one, you know that could potentially implicate B and or if CFC uh, sub one may be a hybrid type entity uh, between the U.S. And the, and the foreign jurisdiction, that could also implicate 267 cap A. So if we move over to CFC foreign hold code, um, you know, first off, we talked about the 956 issues related to the guarantee. And then if you look at, um, you know, payment stream seven and eight, which is foreign opco, which is a disregarded entity is, is, is earning that from a U.S. tax perspective, it would be treated as earned by, by the hold co. You know, those potentially implicate guilty in subpart F. Um, you know, you basically have to analyze it and see how, how that's implicated in, in the various tax profile from that. If you, again, move over to the foreign branch now, as we discussed, you know, no participation exemption, no FDII, and then the separate FTC basket. Um, now, it's CFC sub one, its income stream has uh, number nine and number 10. Part number nine is income and revenue from a foreign unrelated party. You know, just like you know, previous uh, analysis, you would want to analyze to see if potentially subpart F is in, implicated there. But then also the tax reform now is, has created the additional kind of guilty component, and that's similar to, to payment stream 10, which is also a related party payment. You would do the same analysis. And then uh, finally, you know, as we discussed, there may be a purchase then of CFC sub two stock from either foreign acquirer or U.S. acquirer. So under those analysis, what we'd be looking at is, you know, does it make sense to make a 338 election? How does guilty factor into that? How does subpart F factor into that? Or, you know, and then also how, what about 1248 gain and the potential participation exemption? So all of those components are things that the taxpayers would need to be mindful of and, and basically model out the consequences and then finally, if we look at CFC sub two, income stream 12 is income and revenue from a foreign unrelated party and similar to the others, be looking out for guilty and potential subpart F consequences. So that kind of walks through a, a typical, you know, U.S. parent multinational group uh, summary example. So I'll turn it over to Don now for the, uh, the foreign parent side. Okay, so when we move to the foreign side and we have a foreign parent with U.S. operations through U.S. subsidiaries, uh, we also show, you know, various foreign affiliates, uh, U.S. partnership, and dealings with foreign unrelated parties and U.S. unrelated parties. Uh, I think the, the first thing we, we can quickly observe is that uh, the, the changes in the tax law have much less impact on foreign multinationals than they do on domestic multinationals. Uh, but still, there's still some significant changes to, to consider, and we try to highlight uh, a few of them here. So, so first thing we look at is, is a loan from foreign parent to its U.S. subsidiary. Um, not an international tax change, but we note that uh, the new 163J provision uh, imposes a 30% cap on interest deductions in most cases. Uh, so this is potentially a greater limitation on earning stripping than the prior version of 163J, which essentially was an international tax provision for interest payments. Uh, to foreign related parties. Uh, in addition, we note that uh, it, it, in the event that uh, we have these interest payments, uh, we have the potential for application of the base erosion tax if the income threshold's met and the base erosion percentages are met. Um, 
So that also needs to be taken into account with respect to the, the loan from foreign parent to U.S. Hold Co. Next, um, we show an example of downward attribution rule that was discussed earlier in, the, in today's discussion. Here we have foreign parents' 80% ownership of foreign affili affiliate being attributed to U.S. Hold Co. Uh, under the rule, which has the result of creating a CFC. Now, for U.S. Hold Co., that's probably not a big deal as it has no actual ownership in foreign affiliate, and uh, at least the, the current guidance is such that uh, there won't, won't even be any information reporting requirements imposed on U.S. Hold Co. But we do have the, the unrelated U.S. party with its 20% interest, which may be surprised to, to learn that it's now a U.S. shareholder of a CFC, whereas it wasn't under prior law. Um, okay, then number three, we have royalty payments being made by U.S. OPCO to a foreign affiliate uh, that happens to be a hybrid entity for tax purposes. So perhaps foreign affiliate two is a corporation under U.S. tax rules, but a pass-through under local tax law. Uh, if, if that pass-through treatment means that the royalty is not taxable to foreign affiliate two under, lo under local tax law, then the, the new 267A hybrid rule will disallow the deduction to U.S. OPCO. And alternatively, if, if, the, if the hybrid entity rule doesn't apply to the royalty payment, then B becomes a factor to consider uh, because, it, because the royalty is a deductible payment being made to a foreign affiliate. Uh, number four, uh, we see that OPCO, U.S. OPCO is making sales of products outside the United States. This presents the possibility for the deduction under Section 1250 for uh, foreign-derived intangible income, or FITI, uh, deduction currently at a 37.5% rate, getting reduced after 2025. Right. Number five, we see foreign parent selling its interest in a U.S. partnership to a third party. If the, if the U.S. partnership is engaged in a U.S. trade or business, then foreign parents' gain on the sale can be subject to tax under a new 864 provision as effectively connected income to the extent that the gain relates to essentially ECI assets of the partnership. And as noted earlier, there also would be a withholding tax imposed on the foreign acquirer, uh, or uh, basically at a 10 percent rate. and. Uh, uh, would be would reduce the amount of sales proceeds received by foreign parent on the sale. And then finally, uh, return to uh, foreign affiliate one, uh, which is now a CFC, as we discussed earlier, as a result of the downward attribution rule. And here we show that interest received on a loan to uh, the, the U.S. unrelated party is now potentially subject to U.S. withholding tax uh, due to the uh, CFC exception from the port portfolio interest rules. Well, thanks, Don, for uh, walking through that example. And so thank you, everybody, for uh, participating in our, in our webinar series. That concludes part three, and we hope uh, you enjoyed the series. Um, as indicated at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any additional questions, please email them to Megan Green at megan.green at bakerbots.com. And then for purposes of the CLE credit, you know, please include the announced code on the affirmation form, which you can download in the reminder email, which was sent to you yesterday. And if you do not have this form, please email Megan Green again at megan.green at bakerbots.com. And once again, you know, thanks everybody for participating in the webinar, and we hope you enjoyed the series.